In the dim recesses of memory, cradled in the arms of time itself, I recall the days when I donned the blue uniform, a beacon of hope in a world drenched in darkness. I was once a police detective, specializing in missing persons cases, a relentless seeker in the vast sea of human tragedy, dedicating my very soul to the quest of bringing the lost ones home. In my youthful days, at the tender age of twenty-one, the passion ignited within me, a flame that yearned for the pure and unblemished righteousness that seemed to nestle in this niche of the Force. It promised a higher moral ground, a venture where my actions would be unerring beacons of good in a world fraught with complexities and moral gray areas. The nascent flame of this vocation, however, demanded its time to forge me, to ripen my skills and instincts on the streets. Six grueling years of patrolling avenues and alleys, a prelude to the symphony of my real calling. Finally, the moment came, a crescendo that saw me climbing the ranks, blossoming into a detective, and then patiently biding four more years before I could merge with my true destiny, the missing persons department. Ah, those days were a crucible, tempering my spirit with a blend of profound fulfillment and abysmal despair. Each case was a universe unto itself, a narrative woven with threads of hope and tendrils of tragedy. The ecstasy of reuniting a child presumed dead with their frantic, tear-streaked parents was an exhilarating high, a validation of my life's choice, an experience that words could scarcely describe. But as with all tales, shadows lurked in the corners, waiting to engulf the light, cold cases piled up, whispering incessant reminders of my failure into the hollows of my psyche, an ever-present specter of despair lurking in my mind. A relentless gallery of faces haunted my dreams, a panorama of lives lost or left hanging in a void, their fates unknown, their stories unfinished. The dark underbelly of humanity revealed itself, too, in the twisted forms of the perpetrators I faced. The darkness of their souls mirrored the abyss that seemed to be ever widening within me, chipping away at my once unshakable resolve leaving me grappling with doubts that threatened to consume me. The vile depths to which human cruelty could sink were laid bare before me, a testament to the decay that threatened the very fabric of our society. And then came the case that broke the camel's back, an ordeal that yanked me from the cocoon of my profession, hurling me into a void where the beacons of hope flickered and died. A seasoned veteran by then, bearing the weight of responsibility and expectation, I was the figurehead steering the ship in the tempestuous waters of the most heinous crimes. On a day that promised nothing out of the ordinary, I walked into the station, only to be greeted with the news that would mark the beginning of the end. Five tender buds of life, two girls and three boys, mere toddlers basking in the innocence of their early years, had been plucked mercilessly from their familiar surroundings. This malevolent act occurred in an eerily short span, in a neighborhood that now held the whispers of a nefarious shadow. With a heavy heart burdened by the magnitude of the tragedy, I vowed to shield their identities, to protect the sanctity of their youthful innocence and the peace of their grieving families. The particulars of the case held a darkness that I wished to spare the world from, a horror that threatened to engulf the community in a tidal wave of fear and despair. Swiftly, instinct and experience took over, molding the investigation into a frantic race against time. The initial hours were critical, a narrow window where the flicker of hope still held its ground. As the clock ticked inexorably forward, my partner and I ventured into the eye of the storm, meeting the tear-streaked faces of one set of parents, their hearts held together by fragile threads of hope and fear. Simultaneously, our team fanned out, gathering the pieces of a puzzle that threatened to spiral into an abyss of darkness and cruelty. In this monumental moment, I could feel the tectonic shift within me, a premonition that this case would either be my magnum opus or the requiem of my career. The echo of a chilling scream reverberated in my mind as I envisaged the mother dashing outside, only to find a void where her little son had been playing moments before. It was a scenario mirrored in the narratives spun by our neighborhood witnesses, vignettes of fleeting moments where attention was diverted, creating a sinister vacuum that seemed to swallow these innocent lives without a trace. Across the street, in various homes, a common script was unfolding, a chilling orchestration of swift and stealthy abductions occurring in the briefest lapses of watchfulness. My team, operating like a well-oiled machine, swiftly transitioned into the next phase of our investigation, 
where modern technology would lend its eyes to our frantic search. The area from where the children vanished was bordered by a bustling world of commerce, a labyrinth of high streets and shopping centers that held the silent vigil of countless electronic sentinels, recording the ceaseless flow of human activity in their unblinking gaze. Time, however, proved to be a relentless adversary, ticking away precious moments as we delved into the sea of footage, seeking that elusive clue that would unlock the dark secret that held the community in its grim grip. The urgency of our mission resonated in the highest echelons of the department, granting us additional manpower to sift through the gargantuan task that lay before us. A day and a night passed, a whirlpool of faces and cars swirling in an incessant dance on myriad screens until, like a beacon piercing through the fog of uncertainty, the fragment of truth revealed itself. A gathering convened in my office, a congregation of seasoned minds and shaken rookies, brought together by the grim artifact that promised to shed light on the dark enigma that haunted us. The raw energy of dread and anticipation hummed in the air as the junior detectives, their faces a canvas of horror and disbelief, prepared us for the revelation that awaited. With a click, the room plunged into a surreal world, a distorted reality captured in the grainy depths of a CCTV camera perched at the rear of a supermarket. A familiar setting, yet rendered grotesque by and unsettling by the grim narrative it held. A narrow alley where commerce met decay. A passage where bright mornings gave way to shadows that seemed to consume all light and sanity. Our collective breath seemed to hold as the screen bore witness to an apparition emerging from the murky depths. A pixelated figure trailed by smaller forms, slowly morphing into a grotesque parade that seemed to defy the norms of our world. As the group lumbered closer, emerging from the grainy mist into clearer view, a gallery of horror unveiled itself, holding us captive in a trance of disbelief and growing terror. The leader of this twisted procession was a figure carved from the darkest corners of human fear and perversion. A giant among the stolen lambs, his visage concealed behind a macabre mask that drew from the twisted tales of Mr. Punch, a puppet character that now seemed to leap out from the realms of fiction into our grim reality. The pale canvas of the mask bore grotesque exaggerations, a hooked nose jutting ominously above a mouth stretched in a sinister grin that seemed to mock our human fragility. Bulging eyes stared unabashedly, a portal to an abyss where darkness held sway, where sanity frayed at the edges, leaving only the raw, pulsating nerve of primal fear. This harbinger of nightmares bore an attire that seemed to scoff at the norms of society, donning a hat reminiscent of a jester's from times medieval, a grotesque crown that bore silver baubles dancing with a macabre glee at the end of each pointed sleeve. Each detail, each grotesque exaggeration, seemed to be a study in fear, a calculated attempt to delve into the psyche of the viewer, igniting flames of dread that threatened to engulf one's very soul. As I watched, transfixed and horrified, I could feel the icy tendrils of fear wrapping around my heart, squeezing with an insidious pleasure as the mask seemed to peer into the very depths of my being, promising darkness, promising despair. The creator of this unholy visage was not just a criminal. He was an artist of fear, weaving a tapestry of terror that threatened to engulf us all in its malevolent embrace. With a grim resolve settling within me, I knew that this case would take us into the shadowy corridors of human depravity, where monsters wore human masks, and innocence met a fate worse than death. The sinister figure on the screen seemed to engulf the surroundings with his bizarre and grotesque appearance. The cap adorned with bells extended down the back of his head, enveloping any hint of hair, a detail that further clouded his identity. He wore not a coat, but a flowing robe that seemed to defy the norms of fashion and decency, extending past his ankles and pooling around him in a dark parody of a bridal train. It seemed as though the robe sought to embrace the ground, to meld with the darkness that lingered in the narrow alleyway. A patchwork quilt of colors, dark and grim, formed the substance of this grotesque garment. No vibrant colors graced this robe. Instead, it was a tapestry of dismal hues, each one mirroring the dark corners of the human psyche. Muddy brown mingled with grays, maroons, dirty yellows, chemical oranges, and inky greens in a melange of visual discomfort a tapestry conceived to evoke unease, woven with threads spun from the stuff of nightmares. Countless pockets adorn this monstrosity of a garment, each one seeming to harbor its own sinister secret. They scattered across the robe, 
making a mockery of functionality, seemingly ready to ensnare any innocent who ventured too close. From the pockets at his hips flowed ribbons, handkerchiefs patterned with alternating diamonds of black and white, extending like tendrils reaching out to ensnare the innocent souls that followed in his wake. For gripping tightly onto these ribbons were the missing children we had been frantically searching for. A quick analysis confirmed their identities, yet their expressions bore no signs of the fear or trauma one would expect in such a grim scenario. Their faces instead were lit with smiles, their laughter echoing with an eerie and unholy mirth as they clung to the fabric that seemed to extend endlessly, reminiscent of magicians' tricks that defy the realms of reality. Three children on one side, two on the other. They moved with a joyous energy that bore no place in the dark narrative unfolding before us. They had been entrapped in the malevolent waltz choreographed by the sinister piper at the helm, their innocence exploited and twisted to fuel his dark celebration. This grotesque puppeteer skipped jovially, his motions grotesquely exaggerated in a dance that seemed to mock the gravity of his crimes. His feet, adorned in bizarre shoes that curled upwards at the tips, kept time to his eerie jig a dance that seemed to beckon the darkness from the shadowy corners of the alleyway to join in the perverse revelry. In this grim parade, the man played a tune that struck a dissonant chord in my very soul. Scarborough Fair, a melody that once held a place of fondness in my heart, now twisted and contorted into a soundtrack for this nightmare unfolding before us. Each repetition seemed to weave a spell of hypnotic terror, an audible embodiment of the fear that gripped us as we bore witness to this scene. The melody was not pure, it bore the mark of corruption, a note of discord that echoed the dark intentions of the piper who led this procession of stolen innocence. As I watched, rooted to my spot, a chill of realization crept over me. The sinister figure was not merely a kidnapper, he was a maestro of darkness, conducting a symphony of fear and manipulation, drawing these children into a dance of darkness from which there seemed to be no escape. This grim procession meandered through the alley until they vanished from the security camera's range, leaving a void that seemed to swallow the light and hope that once resided in our hearts. My colleagues and I were left stunned, grappling with the reality of the dark tale that had unfolded before us. A frenzy of activity ensued as we scrambled to react, to find a thread of sanity in this tapestry of darkness. Reports flew from our hands urgent calls echoing our desperate plea for witnesses to come forth with any information that might lead us to this malevolent piper and his entranced captives. I remember the heaviness in my heart as I faced the anguished parents, offering reassurances that felt hollow in the face of the growing darkness that seemed to engulf our efforts. Days turned into weeks, and our net widened from city to district, and then, with heavy hearts, we expanded our search to the state level desperate to find any clue that might lead us to the children who had been ensnared in this dark tale. Press conferences were held, the media buzzed with speculation and absurd questions, and the face of the sinister piper became the symbol of the darkness that had descended upon our community. It was towards the end of that first heart-wrenching week when the media christened him The Piper, a name that echoed the grim resonance of the age-old tale of the Pied Piper, drawing eerie parallels to the hypnotic power and malevolent intentions that seemed to emanate from the figure we had witnessed, leading the children into the shadows, into a dance of darkness from which we feared there may be no return. In the midst of a growing maelstrom of panic and desperation, the name given by the media firmly rooted itself in the public consciousness. The piper became a ubiquitous term, whispered with a mixture of fear and morbid fascination in every corner of the community. The enigmatic figure had not only captured the children, but the imagination of the masses, fostering an almost mythic status that spanned beyond the confines of our locality. This morbid fascination seemed to extend even within the police station, where we too found ourselves begrudgingly using the moniker, the Piper, to describe the elusive malefactor who had seemingly vanished into the night with the innocent children. Just as the flickering flame of hope threatened to extinguish completely, leaving us grappling in the darkness of uncertainty and despair, a sudden beacon pierced through the suffocating gloom. A call, originating from a man residing a few towns over, reignited the smoldering embers of our resolve. Late at night, in the alley behind his apartment building, he claimed to have witnessed the distinctive figure of the piper, accompanied by the entranced children. 
Despite the haze of exhaustion clouding his perception, he was certain about the peculiarity of the sight he witnessed. We hurriedly descended upon the location, eager to extract any fragment of information that might propel our investigation forward. As we interrogated the weary witness, it became evident that the late hour and his tired state had rendered his account somewhat fragmented and unreliable, a mere glimpse through the murky waters of fatigue. However, a flicker of hope remained as we were granted access to peruse the security footage that surveyed the shadow-strewn alleyway, a potential window into the eerie procession that had allegedly traversed its confines. My partner Wallace and I ensconced ourselves within the security room, our eyes scanning through reels of footage, time fragmenting as we sought to pinpoint the elusive moment the witness had described. The surroundings caught on the security camera were a reflection of a neighborhood grappling with desolation. Broken glass and refuse littered the cobblestones, painting a bleak portrait of an area forgotten by time and prosperity. And then, infiltrating the silence, came the distant strains of a melody that felt like a ghostly hand reaching into our very souls, drawing forth shivers that cascaded down our spines in rhythmic waves. It was that melody once again, Scarborough Fair, echoing from an undefined distance, the notes weaving through the night air like tendrils of darkness, pulling us into a haunting trance that gradually intensified as the sound approached. As the sinister melody grew in prominence, the scene unraveling before us transformed into a grotesque mirroring of the first footage we had witnessed. The piper emerged from the shadowy depths, a macabre figure dancing through the night, an area orchestra conducted with the haunting strains from his wooden pipe. Behind him trailed the children, their appearances bearing the cruel marks of an extended ordeal. Their once joyful and lively demeanors had given way to visages marred by exhaustion and hunger, their bodies bearing the shocking signs of rapid emaciation. Their movements were no longer sprightly skips, but painful stumbles, as though the life had been drained from them leaving behind only fragile shells being dragged mercilessly forward by the malevolent force that governed their actions. Their grip on the black and white handkerchiefs remained steadfast, a disturbing testament to the psychological hold the piper had on them. Their unwillingness, or perhaps inability, to let go of the fabric evoked a surge of frustration and despair within us. The grip seemed to transcend physical coercion, speaking of a deeper, darker influence that held them captive in a relentless march of suffering. As Wallace and I watched, our hearts laden with a growing dread, a further descent into darkness unfolded before our eyes. The piper's hand moved with a sinister grace, releasing the pipe momentarily, only to delve into the myriad pockets that adorned his grotesque coat. From within, he retrieved a creature that seemed to embody the filth and disease that permeated the environment. A large, aggressive rat, its appearance hinting at a diseased existence. A sickening realization dawned upon us as we watched him raise the rodent high, its frantic movements a grotesque dance in the night air, before being discarded carelessly onto the cobbled ground. This act was repeated, another rat pulled from the undulating depths of his coat, each movement a grotesque mimicry of the previous. But as our focus narrowed onto this chilling act, a greater horror began to unfold in the periphery. A shifting, writhing darkness began to encroach upon the edges of the footage, a seething mass that moved with a malevolent purpose. My heart lodged in my throat as I realized we were witnessing an exodus of rats, a teeming mass of filth and disease that surged forward in pursuit of the piper and his captive audience. Groups of three or four rodents clambered over obstacles, their movements synchronized in a perverse dance of darkness that echoed the piper's sinister melody. The procession of misery continued its relentless march, leaving in its wake a surging tide of vermin that seemed to engulf the very alleyway itself. The haunting figure and the weary children eventually moved beyond the frame, disappearing into the shadowy abyss beyond. Yet, the relentless tide of rats continued, a mass exodus that filled the screen for an agonizing ten minutes, a visual symphony of darkness and despair that bore testament to the growing malevolence that seemed to be consuming our very world. And as the screen finally succumbed to the stillness of the night once again, Wallace and I were left grappling with the horrifying reality that unfolded before us, our resolve hardened, yet burdened by the darkness that threatened to engulf us all in its malevolent embrace. We knew then, more than ever, that time was running out and the piper's malevolent song was far from over. As the shadows stretched across the alleyway, 
Every so often small, rapid movements would punctuate the duskened surroundings, an eerie harbinger of the twisted reality that we were grappling with. The entire investigative team, with every developing revelation, was finding itself entrenched deeper in the morass of horror and disbelief. This evolving nightmare had transformed into something more sinister and unearthly than any of us had ever dared to envisage. A palpable sense of dread hung heavily in the air, smothering our rationality and leaving us floundering in the realms of the unimaginable. The grim metamorphosis of this case forced us into the reluctant acceptance that we were now dealing with forces that transcended our understanding of reality. As the leader of this investigation, a maelstrom of confusion, helplessness, and mounting fear churned violently within me. The image of those innocent children, ensnared in the claws of this malevolent entity, haunted my every waking moment. A deep, gnawing fear settled in my soul, a growing realization that we were venturing into territories unknown, where dark beings, beyond the grasp of human comprehension, lurked in the corners of our darkest nightmares. The path we were traversing began to grow increasingly murky, obscured by a lack of leads, and a growing search area that threatened to engulf our every effort in futility. The meshers I employed in desperation, ranging from car checks to aerial searches, seemed to vanish into a void, leaving us grasping at the thin air of desperation. Even the introduction of sniffer dogs proved futile, adding to the oppressive weight of responsibility that was steadily bearing down upon my shoulders. I felt the harrowing burden of those children's lives pressing painfully upon my conscience, a relentless whisper of the horrors that might be unfolding in some distant, shadow-streaked corner of our world. Facing the parents of the missing children was a descent into a personal hell, an agonizing admission of failure that seemed to echo endlessly through the long, despair-filled days and nights. As weeks stretched into months, the vitality of the case seemed to wither away, leaving behind a hollowed-out husk of lost hopes and fading dreams. My colleagues gravitated towards new assignments, their attention diverted by the demands of a world that continued its inexorable march forward. But I found myself ensnared within the haunting grip of the piper, unable to escape the nightmarish visions that played incessantly within the theater of my mind. Every night, I found myself drawn into the dark, grotesque world encapsulated within those haunting pieces of footage, an unwilling participant in a relentless dance of darkness and despair. Three months later, amidst the dull routine of my duties, an overheard fragment of conversation in a distant precinct shattered the monotonous grip of despair, reigniting a flickering spark of hope within the gloomy recesses of my mind. The chatter revolved around strange occurrences far upstate, a bizarre influx of rodents that seemed to defy natural explanations. As I absorbed the details, a flicker of intuition ignited within me, a desperate grasp at a possibility that seemed to resonate with the dark melody that had been haunting my dreams for months. Driven by an insatiable desire to unearth the truth and salvage some fragment of redemption, I delved deeply into research, seeking to uncover the secrets hidden within a small, rural community enveloped by vast stretches of farmland. A place that seemed to exist on the fringes of reality, where the normal rules of existence seemed to fray at the edges, giving way to the inexplicable and the grotesque. With a heart laden with grim determination, I chose to embark on this perilous journey, bypassing the bureaucratic chains that threatened to shackle our pursuit of truth. My confidant in this dark venture was none other than Wallace, a man whose spirit mirrored my own, a kindred spirit bound to the relentless pursuit of justice, no matter the personal cost. Together, we ventured into the unknown, driven by a force that seemed to transcend rationality, a desperate bid to bring closure to the tormented souls ensnared within the Piper's dark symphony. Despite the passing of a month since the strange migratory events, we press it forward, a shared belief fueling our determination. Our inquiries led us to the outskirts of the community, where the ominous silhouette of a decrepit windmill cast long, dark shadows across an abandoned farm that seemed to resonate with an eerie, palpable atmosphere of foreboding. As the day gave way to the encroaching darkness, we found ourselves surrounded by a surging tide of rodents, a seething mass that emerged from hidden corners and crevices, their movements a frenzied dance of darkness that echoed the sinister energy that seemed to permeate the very air. With hearts pounding in sync with the dark rhythms of the night, we ventured further into the forsaken land, 
the old farmhouse standing before us like a silent guardian of the dark secrets that lay within. Every step forward was a descent into a living nightmare, a surreal world where reality seemed to fragment and warp, giving way to grotesque visions that threatened to engulf our very sanity. Inside, the pulsating mass of rodents swarmed in chaotic harmony, filling the spaces with a nauseating display of primal fervor a living testament to the dark forces that seemed to be gathering strength within these forsaken walls. We tore through the structure, a relentless search for clues amidst the chaos, a fervent desire to unearth the truth that lay hidden within this nightmarish realm. Every corner, every hidden crevice, seemed to harbor a growing malevolence, an oppressive force that seemed to feed off our fear and desperation. As the sun sank further below the horizon, casting the world into an abyss of shadows, we found ourselves drawn towards the looming edifice of the barn that stood sentinel upon the hill, a dark beacon that beckoned us forward with a grim promise of revelations that lay within its decaying walls. As we approached, the weight of the darkness seemed to grow heavier, a tangible force that threatened to engulf us within its malevolent grasp. As we advanced towards the barn, a chill that seemed to seep into our very bones accompanied us, a relentless and foreboding presence that hinted at the unspeakable horrors that lay within the depths of that forsaken place. The once vibrant hues of red and white that adorned the barn were now grotesque parodies of themselves, a symphony of decay showcasing peeling, weather-beaten paint that bore silent witness to the relentless passage of time. Above us, the gaping maw in the roof where timbers had succumbed to rot and ruin allowed slivers of pale moonlight to streak through casting ethereal patterns upon the neglected landscape. With hearts heavy with trepidation, Wallace and I mustered every ounce of courage that lay within us, our hands moving with a unity of purpose as we heaved open the monolithic doors, unveiling the Stygian abyss that lay beyond. The initial wave of putridity that assaulted our senses was a horrendous melange of decay and desolation, a suffocating symphony that bore the stench of anguish and death intermingled in the most perverse manner imaginable. The looming darkness that greeted us within was an all-encompassing entity, a void so impenetrable that our vision was swallowed whole, leaving us standing on the threshold of an unseen nightmare. Unwilling to allow fear to paralyze us, we ignited our torches, the hesitant rays of light slicing through the darkness, unveiling a horror that seemed to pulsate with an unholy life of its own. Our hesitant steps led us through a maze of rotting hay bales that towered menacingly around us, leaning precariously as if threatening to bury us beneath a tomb of festering straw. The ground beneath our feet told tales of forsakenness, a squelching mixture of mud and straw soaked through with the filth and excrement of countless rodents that claimed this place as their unholy sanctuary. The grotesque symphony of sights and sounds seemed to grow in intensity as we ventured further the frenzied rustling and scampering of rats surrounding us in an undulating wave of fur and flesh. These vile creatures appeared to be infused with an unnatural vitality, their masses writhing and shifting within the stacks of hay as though possessed by some demonic force. Our torches revealed a seething mass of life that pulsated within each bale, a living tapestry of horror that seemed to stretch into infinity, where the boundaries between life and death blurred in the most grotesque of manners. The tension grew with each step, a suffocating cloak of fear that seemed to constrict tighter with the passage of time. Our torches revealed an ocean of malevolent eyes that glinted with an unnatural hunger, a chorus of hisses and screeches echoing through the night as we moved ever forward, ever deeper into the abyss. An eerie melody began to permeate the night air, a haunting rendition of Scarborough Fair that seemed twisted and wrong. The gentle lilt transformed into something far more sinister, reverberating within the very core of our beings. The once familiar tune now held a dissonant quality, as if being played on an instrument wrought from darkness and despair. The closer we ventured towards the source of the sound, the more our sense of reality seemed to fragment, leaving us adrift in a sea of dread and unease. Before us, a dilapidated metal door stood sentinel, its once robust frame marred by deep gouges and rust stains that told tales of violence and decay. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to flee, to abandon this place of darkness and never look back. Yet, bound by duty and a desperate need for answers, I found myself unable to retreat. Beside me, Wallace mirrored my resolve, 
his features etched with a grim determination that spoke of a spirit unwilling to succumb to the darkness that sought to engulf us. As we reached the threshold of that hellish portal, we discovered the source of the haunting melody, a battered music box that played a twisted lullaby that seemed to echo the very darkness that surrounded us. Gathering the fragments of our shattered courage, we opened the door, our senses immediately assaulted by a wall of death and decay that seemed to permeate every inch of the space beyond. The nauseating scent threatened to overpower us, a putrid miasma that bore the stench of the damned. Steeling ourselves against the visceral horror that greeted us, we ventured forth, unveiling a chamber of nightmares that seemed to defy the boundaries of human comprehension. Words cannot truly encapsulate the horrors that lay before us, a tableau of suffering and death that threatened to shatter the remnants of our sanity. Amidst the squalor and decay, a perverse semblance of childhood innocence lay twisted and corrupted, a cruel mockery of the vibrant lives that were stolen too soon. Chains and manacles bore silent witness to the unimaginable atrocities that transpired within this hellish place, a testament to the depths of human depravity. As we navigated the grotesque landscape, we discovered a macabre gallery of children's drawings, a twisted testament to the stolen innocence that lay at the heart of this nightmare. Each piece of art bore the stains of violence, a canvas of suffering that hinted at the depths of the darkness that had enveloped this place. In the midst of the horror, we found the grotesque visage of the mask that had haunted our investigation, a grinning monstrosity that seemed to mock us with its twisted mirth. As we retreated from that place of darkness, the weight of our discovery threatened to crush us, leaving us broken and forever scarred by the horrors we had witnessed. In the aftermath, we chose to shield the families from the full extent of the atrocities, a small mercy in the face of such unimaginable evil. Yet, as time has marched inexorably forward, the haunting melody of Scarborough Fair has become a relentless companion, an ever-present reminder of the darkness that lies just beyond the fringes of our reality. As the nights stretch into an endless tableau of darkness and despair, I find myself drawn to the haunting melody, a siren's song that beckons me towards the abyss. The relentless call of the music threatens to consume me, a dark symphony that promises to unveil the true nature of the horror that lies at the heart of the human condition.